Good morning, everyone. My name is Nima Farshi, and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni and Corporate Engagement at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. We're very excited to have our webinar with Mahesh Aditya, um, focused on risk leadership. And I would love to pass it over to Robert Ayamazo, our partner, who is the managing partner of SIBA International. As in a uh, heads up for everyone, this webinar is being recorded. So if you do not consent to the recording, please um, leave the call. Rob, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Nima. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you all again. Uh, again, Robert Iamazo with SIBA International Executive Search. Uh, we are delighted to have our second uh, risk leader leadership webinar series webinar uh, this morning uh, and delighted to again partner with, uh, with the University of Maryland and Business School and Professor Cliff Rossi. Uh, our distinguished guest uh, this morning is Mahesh Aditya, uh, who is currently the CEO of Centender uh, USA Consumer, uh, as well as being on the board of AutoFi. And Mahesh has risen his career and started his career uh, many years ago in banking, uh, has worked across many, many different geographies, uh, different functions in operations, uh, risk uh, technology, and now being uh, CEO. Uh, and so today's discussion is really going to be centered around uh, a, a recent trend that we've been seeing. And Mahesh, perhaps you started that trend uh, where CROs are being transitioned into CEO spots there. Um, and I'll turn it over to, to Cliff, uh, who will uh, start the, uh, the interview today. Thanks a lot, Rob, for that introduction. And uh, again, welcome everybody uh, to our uh, latest installment of our risk leadership series. And so with that, uh, let me give you a little bit of background on this before we go into it. As Rob said, uh, we're here to really today explore uh, how you can take yourself from a risk position uh, into, biz into a business position as, as Mahesh has done and find out about how that uh, interplay between the dynamics of the risk organizations and the business organizations actually work in that context. Uh, and so, so I'll just start right off. off. Uh, first thing I tell everybody that's uh, uh, in attendance here today that if you have questions for Mahesh, uh, please put them into the chat as we go through our Q&A. And what I'll do is I'll pick them up toward the end and I'll pose them to Mahesh and see how many of those we can get in, in our, our hour long session here today. So again, it's not all that un, uh, common, although I think uh, as Rob said that uh, we've seen somewhat of a trend starting here. To see a CEO who had previous, previously been in the seat the CRO seat at some point, let alone having been, as I, as, I, as I recall, Mahesh, you also having done a tour of duty as COO too along the way. So your, your career path, Mahesh, is, is, is quite interesting one that I think risk professionals can learn from. So with that as our backdrop, um, what factors do you, do you see or do you think are critical in making such a move? And, and, and how does that, I guess I'd come back and say, how does that relate to uh, to, to what kind of attention that receives from the board. Uh, yeah, thanks Cliff and thanks Rob for the introduction uh, and thanks again for the opportunity. So, uh, so you're right. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been the CEO of this business for a couple of years and uh, one of the things that I've been told often is that thank God you were the CEO when the pandemic happened because you, you know, you, you were the, uh, the former CRO of the of the bank in the US and you probably brought some sort of innate ability to deal with crises like this. So, you know, for me, it's it's mostly the fact that I was in the right place at the right time uh, that, you know, everything kind of worked out. But the way I would look at this is that there are some basic ingredients that people look for when they, when they, when they appoint somebody to the CEO position. Uh, you know, one of them obviously is uh, the fact that they are able to understand uh, the business and understand all of the different moving parts of the business and how things come together and make uh, decisions in the best interest of the overall PL rather than just manage one, one you know, important line item. Uh, they also look for uh, the ability to carry, to bring the team along. So there's some sort of, you know, uh, you know, your ability to actually have, uh, to be able to drive the consensus opinion and get people 
on the on the same page without without being without being aggressive about it or without taking hard inflexible positions. Uh, I had the good fortune of having um, the former CEO uh, of Santander in the U.S. Uh, as somewhat of a mentor and a close you know and, and a good friend of mine who along the way gave me the right sort of pointers along you know on how I should I should position myself in order to be uh, in order to be a contender for the role. Uh, so I think you know long story short I think it's really important if these people want to aspire for business positions uh, they they need to be aware that they will be assessed along a whole set of parameters that are not necessarily have anything to do with risk but have a lot to do with their ability to be you know part of a team to to take the team along, et cetera. What do you think uh, for some people, you know, I don't want to say there's maybe an inherent bias against, you know, those of us in the risk profession at times to kind of make that leap, but there can be, you know, some of the aspects that really kind of uh, have a self-select into the risk profession to begin with may not be always the kinds of backgrounds that are most suitable for the kind of position that you're in currently, you know, the, the, the broad leadership, the kind of the ability to kind of see across a lot of things. So how, how, do you, how do you make that leap from risk, you know, to such a role? I mean, how does that, how does that kind of even, how did that happen for you? I know you said you talked about you had mentors along the way, but what do you think were the key intangible ingredients that made you sort of land in that position? So, so Cliff, you and I share, you know, we have a, um, we were both around during the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. I, I, I have a feeling that there, there, that, that there was a point of inflection for the risk community at that time, right? Prior to that, and many of us um, know what, what the world was like prior to the, prior to the 2008 financial crisis, when risk people had a particular place in the organization, and you know, we can we can talk about that uh, separately. But I think post financial crisis, there's been an appreciation of the real value add of a of a strong risk manager, and I think there's also this appreciation that risk managers have an opinion that everybody in the business needs to needs to listen to. Uh, now I'm not saying if every single institution has that kind of culture, but I've been fortunate to have worked in companies that have encouraged uh, people to have a view, and. Uh, you can't be a sort of shrinking violet risk manager who sits quietly on the side and only talks when there's a when there's a risk issue being discussed on um, you know um, by the business. People in sales jobs and relationship jobs uh, have a natural affinity to uh, to to being at least positioning themselves as leaders, and I think the business wants you know has, it sort of gravitates towards them. They have. They have the they have the industry contacts. They're able to talk in a much more fulsome way about you know the market, competitors, etc. Risk people don't don't have that sort of natural uh, connectivity. But I think uh, in order for you to be in order for you to be an effective risk manager, you need to build those build those connection points. My uh, general sort of thesis on this has been that if you're really really good at what you're doing. Uh, the recognition will come, and it's certainly in my case, I was never under the under any kind of pressure when I was the CRO to take anything other than the risk position and watch out for the risk that the organization was exposing itself to. With the carrot being dangled in front of me, that one day you're going to be the business manager, and therefore you should start thinking more like a business person. I'm hoping that now that I'm in the CRO role, that I am in no way encouraging my risk community in my organization to assume or to wear a business hat just because I, you know, I'm sort of telling them that there's no other way you can make pro make progress in the organization. So I think it's incumbent upon CEOs to look at risk managers who actually see the soft underbelly of an organization and are probably in a much better position to tell you what's 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 not working as potentially people would be really, really good in, you know, in leadership roles. Yeah, you know, that, 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 that's interesting. I am, uh, so I'm going to ask you, so what do you miss most uh, from your CRO role? Uh, to be really honest with you, I miss the ability to just say no. 
uh, you know, in 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 my current position, I, I I can't sort of say that in as many words because I have to listen to everybody's viewpoint, and there are all these other countervailing pressures like you know what will the market think and how will the market react and what will the regulators think and and all of those kinds of things. But the CRO for me can be can can afford to be the purest in the room and say I I just don't don't have a good feeling about this or these are the five different reasons why I don't think we can do this deal. Uh, there, there is again. I think the inflection point was two thousand eight after the financial crisis, where I think risk people it, it it dawned on everybody that risk people needed to be given the respect, and therefore you had this. I have a feeling the dynamic between business leaders and risk leaders has has improved, uh, and you know worked in favor of risk people significantly since then. Yeah, I'd like to probe on that a little bit more. I have a theory about that. I'd like to test, test, get your thoughts about that, which is, I agree. I think there's been a sea change. In fact, you know, I, I joke around with some of my colleagues from industry and say, maybe I left met, left the CRO seat myself a little too early, given some of the changes that came about. Uh, that having been said, um, sometimes I, I wonder to what extent there's, it's been a you know, a foxhole mentality. People get religion when they're in a foxhole situation. And so after the crisis, they realize that, oh yeah, we need this thing called risk management. And so I guess my point is how much of it do you think is regulatory driven, let's say by big banks from, from a heightened expectations standpoint, okay, you've got to have a risk committee, you've got to have executive sessions, you got to do this, you got to do that, uh, as opposed to have, have organizations maybe gotten pushed a little bit that way but do they have they have they become uh, more risk centric, or sh shall I say, their culture has now ingrained themselves with more risk DNA? So it may have originally started as them being pushed into a different kind of relationship with the risk people in their organization, but I think it's evolved at least you know in the, in the larger organizations. I definitely think that it's evolved into into more of an acceptance of what the risk manager's role is in an organization. There's one other very, very critical thing, uh, Cliff, as you're well aware, is when we were pre-financial crisis, we, then I'm talking about 2008, pre-financial crisis, we would discuss risk as essentially credit risk, right? I mean, the, the mm -hmm. risk guy was responsible for credit risk, was responsible for loan loss reserves, and that's where the conversation ended. With Dodd-Frank and all, all of the subsequent evolution of regulatory sort of guidelines, heightened, high to heightened standards being, being the most critical among them, uh, both on the side of the OCC as well as the Fed. I think it's now become incumbent upon risk managers to not just look at credit risk, but all, you know, a whole variety of different risks, which is why I think the risk person's role in the organization has now expanded into more than just watching out for delinquencies and losses and, you know, classified loans and all of that stuff. And I think people who don't understand that, CROs who don't understand that, sort of much more much more wit and breadth to their job do so at their own peril for two reasons one is you can get you can get sideways with uh, with your regulators very quickly and the other thing it just doesn't prepare you for a higher level of management whereas I, i've seen the more effective cro's being people who are in the detail who understand everything about the operation all the issues the gaps how how to how to address them and almost become an indispensable ally to the CEO uh, in terms of here's a truth teller, here's somebody who really understands the, the wiring of the business and I'm going to rely on him or her to, to, to tell me what's going on. Yeah, that's, that, that, I, I agree with that. The, uh, uh, the one thing, right, is risk professionals, we tend to be highly analytical people. Again, that we kind of self-select into that, uh, that domain, if you will. Um, so how can, you know, in that role, in that sort of like key person role, if you will, for a CEO, can, can a CRO or, or their, the risk professionals that work in these ERM functions kind of stress themselves to think more strategically, right? It tends to, you know, uh, we all kind of come up in some sort of specialty area, right? Consumer credit, auto, right? Whatever it might be, and then kind of wind up broadening our portfolio of risk. But that sort of still doesn't give that breadth of scope of understanding the whole landscape of the business. So it's almost kind of coming back again to what we started with here, which is, you know, how can risk professionals kind of build this muscle mass around not just learning the tools and the techniques and the concepts. We all kind of do that just by nature of what we do in our jobs, but it's that, that sort of intangible skill set that comes with 
that builds the stature of, of, of that risk professional in the organization that says, you know, this person is not is not only good at what they do, but they have they have a a, a broad focus. They can see a lot of things, right? So how how do we kind of cultivate that in our organizations? Does that just come through experience or what? Well, there's a couple of things. One is it comes through experience. The other is it comes through an innate ability, a sort of curiosity, right? Some mm-hmm. people just get put off from some of the aspects of risk management, which just don't interest them. You know, it's like market risk is too complicated. I don't want to sit around and with a bunch of treasury guys. I don't really understand CCAR. You know, the finance guys do that well, but, you know, it's fine. Uh, you really have to, as you get more senior in the risk organization, paradoxically, unlike other functions somewhat in the risk organization, as you get grow up, as you get more senior, you have to get more detailed. You can't, you can't be this sort of strategist in the room sitting back and making speeches, right? You need to be a guy who really, really understands the wiring of the place and really understands it. And the way to do it is not for you to go in and actually you know, be in the transaction necessarily, but I think there's a basic ingredient of curiosity and the ability to attract talent. I've seen really, really effective risk managers being able to go out into the market and hire really, really talented people and I kind of sort, of sort of somewhat pride myself in the fact that over the years, I've kept up a really strong network of people in all of the organizations that I've worked with. And I've had this ability to tap into the vein of risk talent. Rob has helped me a lot uh, to be able to tap into this vein of risk talent and actually get access to high quality risk managers. You can't do everything yourself, you know, but you have to know where to go for the right person. And I think the credibility that a really competent risk manager who can speak at multiple levels of risks in the organization and is not afraid to say he or she doesn't understand or doesn't know and will go and figure it out very quickly. I think the, uh, the value of having such a person is, is enormous. And I think people should, people should sort of, people who currently work in risk roles should aspire to be that kind of a risk manager. That's interesting. I, I did want to touch more on this concept of cultivating risk talent uh, and the yeah. like. And I guess uh, to, to that to that point you just made, um, you talk about you know hiring uh, risk managers into your organization. So, what sort of knowledge, skills, and abilities do you think it takes to kind of attract your attention for hiring you, hiring them into your organization as a risk person? You said you. I'm sorry. Would... You talked about this. This innate, this innate curiosity, I call it being a risk detective almost. And that seems to be central to, to kind of your, your thought process there. So there are two, two or three things I look for. One is how, much, how, how many jobs has this person done and how many different kinds of jobs has this person done? Uh, and then, you know, I mean, like if somebody has, been a, been work, has worked in mortgages or worked just in auto or credit cards or whatever, or, or, or in the investment bank, have, have they just been down that narrow lane of one particular function? just because at some point you get a sense that this person is risk averse. Uh, because I was accused once many years ago of being risk averse because I'd sort of chosen this one furrow down which I just wanted to specialize. And somebody said to me, you might, you might call it whatever you're calling it, but it's definitely a risk averse strategy that you, you're only taking certain kinds of jobs because you don't want to take risk. So I kind of look for that. I look to try and see if there's somebody who's done a variety of roles, right? Um, and just speaking of myself, one of the reasons why I was so curious uh, about one of the moves that I made, I stepped out of banking for three years uh, when, I, when I was working at uh, when I was working at Chase. I, I, I went to Visa in San Francisco, and I was there for three years. And I, then then I came back to then I came back to Santander. But that experience did a lot to reinforce my view that you know you do need a much much more holistic sort of view. The other thing I look for is individuals, you know, during the interview process, how many questions do I get asked? Am I the only one doing the talking? And is the person genuinely interested in knowing something about the company, something about me, something about, you know, the the job expectation, et cetera. And the third most important thing is what kind of a network that that, does that individual have? So I will definitely call around and do cross checks and, and, you know, reference checks. Uh, to try and get a feel as to what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, what's the word on the street on this particular person. I'll remember that when I'm applying for a job. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so my next question is, okay, so you've got these people in your, in your organization now. How do you cultivate them, right? How do you kind of 
you know, move them along so that they uh, can find opportunities and growth and all those other things that come along with, you know, being able to not only attract the talent, but, but, but retain that talent, particularly in a, in a very competitive market that we find ourselves in today. Yeah, I, I think it's the, uh, the one thing I've told people in my organization is that there is not some intergalactic human resources process that's it person sitting here managing your career, right? That's, that's incumbent upon you to figure out where, where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do. The, the thing that I encourage people to do is firstly, uh, if you don't have clarity around, around your career progression, try and find somebody who can spend some time with you once a month, once, you know, in, in whatever, you know, a couple of months, give you some, some sort of career advice. So I open, we've created a, what I think is a pretty good mentorship program in the company that I work in. Uh, the other thing is, I definitely encourage risk people to look outside of the risk function to hone their skills. And eventually, you know, with the view that the first 10 years, the way I see it, the first 10 years of your career is, is all about building, building your skills and building your self-confidence. And at that point, you can then make a decision. Do I want to do this, that, or the other thing? And do I even, do I even want a career in risk management, right? Because uh, because those things come out of, out of the confidence to do that comes out of uh, some sort of bedrock of experience where you know that you can speak fluently about something that you, a skill that you bring to the table. Uh, the skilling up is really important. And I think skilling up doesn't stop. It has to keep going on. It's a continuous process. Um, you just, you just continuously have to understand that the learning process keeps going on. And they, you know, it got, Somebody told me recently, God's given you two years and one mouth for a reason, right? So it's like you've got to you've got to be a better listener than a better than a better yeah. talker. Yeah, yeah, and, and that resonates with me because uh, you know I always talk about being an accidental risk manager. You know, I didn't go to school for it. Who does? And uh, we kind of get a lot of on-the-job training, if you will. So that kind of ongoing, right, continuous improvement process that we probably all have to from do to do from some time to time certainly goes hand in hand with what you were just saying. I want to shift gears a little bit, kind of focus back on a little bit on our on our shared heritage, if you will, for a moment and how that affects risk perspectives. So yeah, you and I are both veterans of the uh, the 08 crisis. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I think that that kind of hardened us up for for other things, which is a, which is a good thing, I suppose. Um, but given that experience, um, how does that shape sort of your your views today, you know, your perspectives, you know, as a CEO uh, in light of what you've seen, what you've experienced? Uh, I, so I think that I still have a lot of scar tissue from that period, right, Cliff, as I'm sure you do too, right? But uh, so so I think, I think the fundamental thing for me is, you know, when it was one of the senior uh, banking leaders who recently made, made the comment uh, and, has, and has been known in the asked to make this comment is that every single one of my business heads is, is a risk manager. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that view. I think coming out of the last financial crisis at the risk of, at the risk of sounding rash and what I'm going to say, I, I don't think the risk, of, risk uh, function was sufficiently respected. Uh, I think we, we all got sort of led down this garden path that, uh, that, that we, we, weren't, we weren't thinking along the lines of of business managers think like a business person. I, I mean, I've heard that said to me, uh, me dozens too. of times, right? Think like a business person. Now, when I have a CRO at my in my in my management team, I don't want him to start thinking like a business person. That's not why I'm paying him his paying him his salary, right? He has to he has to think like the risk manager. Uh, the salespeople have to think about sales, and the CFO has to think about the you know the P and L and the balance sheet. So everybody has a role to play in an organization and everybody can't be doing every, somebody else's job. So I think one of the big learning points that came out of that was that, look, risk people need to be respected. They bring something to the table. There's a tremendous amount of value that you know, a really good risk manager brings. The other thing that my biggest learning from that was uh, learn to stand your ground. Uh, it, you often are alone uh, and nobody agrees with you. How many times... Uh, Cliff, since you and I kind of sort of cross paths in the same business, um, how many times were we sent a data tape and told that we needed to we needed to uh, you know buy those loans because they were just spectacular loans? 
and balance sheet them because this this was the best trade, you know, and we were going to, we had to execute it. And we all knew, we, we all know where that ended up, right? With scant information, I remember there was one transaction where um, they didn't have the delinquency information on the on the loan file. They only had the origination of FICO and we were asked to take it for at face value, otherwise walk away from the transaction. So British people get put, put into these impossible situations. And at that time, I think, you know, you just have to stand your ground. You have to have the intestinal fortitude to say, I just think that this is not the right thing to do. And I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to sign off on this particular transaction. Uh, and I think today there's there's a lot of wind at the back of risk organized of really good risk managers in order for them to come away from that kind of an experience with very little, you know, Scott issue as I call it. The other really really important ingredient that was highlighted during the financial crisis and has become increasingly important is that for to be an effective risk manager, you have to be the best communicator. You can't be a waffler. You can't be somebody who takes ten minutes to say something you should be saying in one. Right, and which is why the best, most efficient, really, really high quality risk managers are people who just, you know, in a very succinct way, are able to encapsulate a complicated idea, and are able to put it across in a really effective way. So I think communication is oftentimes overlooked as something that you sort of figure out along the way. But I think there are, it's really worth investing in that and being a little more self-aware about how how you're coming across as a communicator. Uh, that's 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 interesting. I, I I when you were telling your story there about about those data tapes and those deals coming through, it reminded me of my uh, I call it my seven my seven month sabbatical at, at Washington Mutual. I was I was there the first on day one. They handed me something like that, and they said it's a like a four hundred million dollar transaction. And they said, and it's okay. You we you don't need to look at anything else. And I'm like, I'm not signing this on day one. So that was the beginning of the end for me, I think. And uh, so I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, risk managers are, you know, not there to say yes. They're not there to say no. They got to, in my mind, they're the umpires that you as the CEO are wanting an unfiltered, objective, independent view of that risk. And it's what makes the job hard. Um, and, uh, but I think you, you, you build your integrity from doing that. It may not be the most pleasant career path if you have to bounce from time to time, but uh, that I totally get that. I, I, I do wonder um, about about folks that are in the industry that don't have that experience, right? They don't have those those hard lessons that that we learned in 08. That uh, you know, when I go out to talk to people, just yesterday we were doing a a risk training for for a group, and my my first question is, show of hands, how many people you know were in the industry in two, 2008 or before? And I get as many hands as I as I used to. So. Um, what do you? What, how do you shape those those perspectives without having that uh, that that one seminal event that I think those of us that that have that experience always keep in the back of our mind and, and look out for? How do you, how, can you give us some insights on how you kind of go about that or suggestions for people that are out there today that are that, that look at us talking about these things? Oh, it could never have been that way, right? But yes, it was. Yeah, I think. You know, as you and I talked earlier, there's people today in middle management with, you know, 15 years of experience who were not employed during the financial crisis uh, or, you know, were young and were coming out of school or whatever. So you, that I think was, was a seven. I thought the pandemic was going to actually, you know, it's really kind of miraculous that the way, the way we've come out of the pandemic, I think largely because of the stimulus money. But I thought this, the pandemic was going to be one such situation where, we really didn't know, uh, you know, there wasn't a light at the end of the tunnel and you had no idea how this thing was going to end up. But I do remember during the financial crisis, there were some things that touched everybody, right? So there were people like yourself and, you know, um, El Ramesh, who was, who was then the CRO at JP Morgan uh, and at Citibank, who were really, really close to the fire. You were sort of there in the middle of the, of the mortgage thing. I was a little bit peripheral. I was in home equity at the time which, of course, completely <laughs> flamed out, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, but then, yeah, and then, and then I was a little bit more peripheral because after home equity, I moved into the consumer bank and uh, at, at, uh, at Chase. 
And I, I was just kind of watching this movie play out among the mortgage folks where they were writing down larger and larger amounts of, of money every every quarter, you know, in loan loss reserves and in losses. Until it actually began to hit me, I got a call on December 8, 2000, December 11, 2008. I was sitting in my office and I got a call from the CRO of uh, Chase, John Watkins at the time, who told me, he says, um, just, 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 just watch the news. I said, no, I'm sitting in my office. He said, he said, um, can you quickly run and check whether you have an account with somebody called Bernie Madoff? Uh, you know, sure enough, go and check. And there was an overdraft line and the guy just drawn it down, you know, two days earlier. Uh, <laughs> Um, similar event happened with Lehman. Lehman had a billion dollar line of credit, which was immediately drawn down. So all of those things sort of affected us. And then you remember the auction rate uh, securities that the market drew up, like sort of dried up on, and all of a sudden there was no market for it. So, so that 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 was sort of massive uh, drinking uh, out of a fire hydrant, literally, because it was just coming at you over a very very short period of time. And uh, it's a difficult experience to replicate, but you can live it vicariously by talking to people and 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 understanding that when you have a senior person such as yourself Jeff, who's telling you that there are five or six things that you need to watch for as a risk manager. I'd never want a current CRO or current risk manager to ever have to go through a crisis like that because that's not the best because you who knows how you how, how you're going to come out at the other end. But it was an enormously valuable experience, and you know I'm glad that we are here on a on a. Uh, you know, on a screen, being able to talk about it. Uh, but there's a lot of knowledge that we can transmit and transfer over to the, you know, to the, to the, to the younger generation. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree with you there on that. The, uh, the, you know, my master's students, for example, sometimes look at me with, you know, their eyes glaze over when they say, oh, I couldn't possibly have happened when I tell some of those war stories. And yet, as you just described in good detail, that uh, that did happen, and uh, and, and it kind of goes back and reminds me that you can have all the good risk infrastructure and policies and procedures and frameworks in place, but if, as you say, here's a tape, you've got to you, we won't, we only have an hour and a half to uh, to look at it before we're going to have to pass on it. You know, th that's no way to run a ship, and and you know the lack of DNA in the organization culture, if you want to call it that. And, and governance, good governance is is most of the battle in my opinion. So, um, and, and it's hard, right? To, to kind of let people that haven't shared that experience with you really kind of truly embrace it and understand that, well, things are different now for the time being that, that there's there's uh, no guarantee something like that can't circle back at, at a future point and come in some other shape or form too. So who knows? Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm curious to know about is the the dynamics between you now as CX? You talked you touched on a little bit here, but um, the dynamics of, of you as CEO and how that works with your CRO, having been in that person's seat, how does that sort of uh, uh, relationship work relative to what you've seen in your prior experiences before? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at that with rose rose tinted glasses. My CRO probably wants to jump into the call right now and tell everybody <laughs> what an absolute what an absolute jerk I am. But <laughs> but I think I, I think part of the part of the uh, what I do put a lot of pressure on the risk organization for is they need to be analytical to the extent analytical and curious to the extent that they 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 create a lot of the discussion. I don't want the risk person to be the guy standing with the catchers waiting for it to come at them, uh, but actually be the person who creates the discussion through analytics and through uh, through the real, just the knowledge that they have of how the system is either working or not. So I think I, I hold my risk uh, organization to a, probably a slightly higher standard than I hold the rest of the organization. Some of it is because I think that there's a there's a tremendous amount that the risk organization can contribute, and the second thing is, obviously, there's a sense of these are all the things that I couldn't do, or that I didn't do. So I have a much more acute sense of my personal feelings as a as a, as a CRO, and I bring it and I take it out on them, saying, "Don't make the mistakes that I made. Make sure that you come informed. Make sure that you're preemptive, that you're proactive, that you bring stuff to the table rather than." Have somebody else discover it, or the crisis be upon you before you, you know, um, before you have to come up with an answer. I 
think just again standing afar from where where you're at and you're in the organization i would think that's really healthy though um because you've had you you have balance right you, you were in that seat you're actually in the coo seat then you're in the ceo seat i mean so from my from my vantage point that's balance that must work i won't say that i'll let you speak to that but it seems like that would really have uh that would that would speak well to how the board views that, right? That 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 and the organization itself sees that there's somebody that's just not in the in the seat to think pure has always been a business guy or a salesperson or whatever it is, that this person has also seen both sides of that risk and return. How does that work, uh, Mahesh, in the context of the interactions with the board? Um, do you see any kind of uh, you know, views from that or perspectives that having been in the CRO seat kind of gives you some additional street cred, if you want to call it that, for, for having done that before? Yeah, so this board is the board that actually picked me from my earlier position of CRO of uh, Santander in the U.S. to be the CEO of, of the auto company. So there's, they have a lot of skin in the game to make to to making sure that I'm successful in this job. I also get a tremendous amount of respect from them when I talk about risk issues, because to your point, I think they know that there's a couple of things. One is, I think you automatically get the respect from the board that this guy was a CRO, he's worked in other organizations, he's got a much broader spectrum of experience. But the other thing is you can't say stupid stuff then, right? So you actually got to say stuff that makes a lot of sense, both from a business perspective as well as from a risk perspective. And they want to be able to see that uh, ingredient in you that you're not just bringing, you know, you're not the sort of sky is falling kind of guy, but you're bringing something to the table that is material and that it either you, you averted a crisis or you, you're, you're in a situation that you're going to have to work extra hard to try and, uh, to, to, to try and avoid the, the sort of fallout from, but the board needs to see that academic work to see need, need to see that sort of depth of thought. Uh, in order for them to take you, so you, you only get you know you only get so many strikes with the board, right? Uh, so you've got to be really really careful that each time you make a run at them, that it's that that your credibility doesn't get questioned, or that you don't say stuff that's unfounded. And I, I guess that's the conservative side of me. I've seen business people who believe that you know I'm the business head, I'm going to lead this place, but you know I've got an innate sort of sense of how to run businesses because I've got all that experience. I'm acutely conscious of the fact that this is the first time I'm running a business. So I, the real skill that I bring to the table is that I can tell you if there's a risk coming down the pike, I can probably see it faster and clearer. I can look around corners probably faster and clearer than most of the other guys can. But that's the only real differentiating factor that I have. I'm not an innate business leader. So I'm developing that skill right now. But I don't want anybody to be fooled by the idea that I'm going to bring into the room this sort of overall great business vision. Because right now I need, I'm still in the process of having to, you know, go to learn my way through that. Yeah, that's, that's a great perspective. I would think that that would hold you in good stead with, with the regulators, right? I mean, I think that what the fire safety and soundness regular, I'd be looking at that going, this is, this is, um, how should I say it? This is a breath of fresh air, right? That we have somebody who's, who is, uh, you know, from that risk background that's that's looking at both sides of this in a in a way that perhaps we haven't seen before. So it seems like that would be the case. I think with regulators, Cliff, as you well know, is it's a it's a longer process, right? With the regulators, yeah. you have to earn your earn your spurs with them. You have to earn your credibility. I think the one thing that's held me in good stead with the regulators started way back in my career when I saw behavior on the other side. I'm going back to my pre-financial crisis days where they felt the bullshit factor in businesses was so high that you just felt that, you know, that you could talk your way out of any situation. And I sort of saw that very early on in my career. And I realized that this is not a workable strategy, right? So for me, I think the one thing with regulators that has, I think, earned me a little bit of credibility is brutal honesty and give them a heads up if something bad is going to happen. You can't, you can't sort of have them walk into a crisis situation, uh, you know, and say they, it's a postmortem is never a good situation. So, so I think they appreciate that. They appreciate the fact that we've changed the culture somewhat in this place. And I'm, I have an open line of communication to them. And I, I, you know, I'm 
I'm not shy of telling them that look, there's a problem, and you know we're trying to fix it, but you know this is what happened. Yeah, no, I, I was a big fan of self identification uh, back in the day, and I did. My my observation was to that point that it it does seem to hold you in better stead. You know, the regulators yeah. will look at you as if you know you're a straight shooter, right? You're you're gonna you know call it for what it is, and and I'm gonna fix it. Uh, and that's and that that's good. But like you said, I mean, it, it, there's a longer you know, tr- you know arc there for for getting them on board with things, and and they kind of still have to stay somewhat removed from that. You touched on this this point. I want to come back to it on risk culture because I'm a big fan of talking about risk culture because I you either have it or you don't. And and but sounds like um, you know you've done a, you you've made some strides in kind of moving risk the needle on that. And I'd like to, to kind of explore that a little bit more because. It's such an intangible thing, right? We talk about a lot in risk and we say, oh, you know, you got to have the right culture and it's the tone from the top and everything. And since you are at the top there, how do you do that? How do you take that? And you and I both have kind of seen, and you kind of were talking a little bit about it before, but, you know, I've been in places that I'd walk into a meeting and they'd say, here comes the business prevention unit. I'm serious. They would say that. And and so I know that must not be going on with, with you on, on deck there. So how do you, how do you, uh, how do you remessage or reconfigure an organization that maybe needed a little nudge in the right direction to that? Does that come from you to the directs? Uh, how does that uh, how does that work so that the lines of communication all the way through the organization get it that uh, we are all on the same team, whether we're on a first line, second line, or third line uh, of defense? I think the the one biggest thing which I honestly had only towards the back end of my career as CRO. Uh, but I missed right through my career was the lack of business support, the lack of sponsorship from a business leader. Uh, to your point, uh, you know, to be able to actually publicly support the CRO, and I think that that acted to that just made me a lot more uh, sort of hardened in my views uh, early on. And it was only when I started working at the risk of you know naming names. It's only when I started working for Scott Powell, who's currently at Wells Fargo. Uh, who I had known for many years, that I really felt that the function was getting respect in the organization, uh, and and I think that was one of the that was that was that's what's kind of shaped my attitude towards the risk organization. I think I hold them to a higher standard because I expect them to deliver the goods and to be uh, you know to be at, if, if not the smartest guys in the room, one of the smartest guys in the room who bring real ideas, who bring real sort of risk prevention solutions and suggestions. And I'm a big a cheerleader for not just the risk people that I directly manage, but also people in the overall company. Uh, I'm still considered a risk talent in the organization. And the CRO of the group still calls me on a whole bunch of issues. So that, that connectivity is really important. I think that gives, uh, not wanting to speak for other people, but I think that gives the members of at least sometimes there is risk organization, some sense of comfort that I'm not, I haven't, you know, that I'm a very strong sponsor of theirs. And I think that's, it's really important. I mean, whether you have, whether you come down the CRO track and become a CEO or whatever, it's very important for CEOs to understand that risk people, this just by virtue of the jobs they do, very hard jobs, where they have to take a counter position oftentimes, uh, need the support, need the career support, need the management support, and need to understand that somebody's got their back. Yeah, otherwise we get off the uh, rails very quickly, right? Uh, yeah. Things things turn out to be us, them, all these other bad, bad, you know, very toxic environments that I'd like to avoid going forward. You know, I I, did, I want to pick up. There's a question that did come in, and I'm just because it kind of fits into some of this vein that we've been talking about. The question is that CFOs become CEOs regularly. Uh, what should the CRO be doing to get into such a position so it's a natural choice? Does it make sense for the, for CROs to become CFO first to get ready to be a CEO? What's your thoughts about that? This is CFO angle. Yeah, I mean, the CFO is a natural sort of uh, adjunct to the CEO. The CEO oftentimes, you know, needs the CFO around to, you know, to talk numbers, to talk specifics around, you know, the p and all of that. So they get put into a position of visibility. Uh, the board sees them a lot more than they see the CRO. Uh, and, you know, the, across the ecosystem, CFOs naturally get get a much better rap than the CRO does. I think it's really important to go back to the point that I made earlier. 
is for the CRO to definitely be somebody who's bringing value to the table, either through independent work or through an independent point of view, uh, which is well-researched, like what we're going through right now, right? We have an inflation problem in the country. We have the Fed acting in some people's view irrationally. We have supply side problems. We have demand issues. Our, the business that I manage has this whole sort of structural uh, uh, issue around new car supply and or used car supply and auction markets, et cetera. Uh, I would expect the CRO in my business to be one of the better informed people, not just about what's currently happening, but to have a view into the future. And I think that is what makes the CRO much more valuable in my opinion than any other function, whether it's the CFO or the head of sales or whatever. I think the CRO brings a much, much more rounded sort of view, should be able to bring a much more rounded view of what's going on you know, in the industry and in the company. I think that's I think that's spot on. I think you know if you look at our backgrounds or, or most of our backgrounds, you have to. You started off by saying you know it's not just focusing on just the credit risk. You've got to you've got to understand the financials, right? You were talking a little lot about it earlier that your your own background. You spent a lot of time diving into understanding the business, how the business works, and I think that's essential for a risk manager to be successful too. And um, and so that eclectic you know, background that, that you have, you know, you got to know a little bit about finance, a little bit about, you know, accounting, a little bit about, you know, the business side, the leadership side, and all these other things that uh, kind of make you a well-rounded individual. And part of that executive team, I think are part and parcel of that. So I totally agree. You mentioned the auto lending business. I, I would like to kind of circle back on that because you brought up it's a, uh, you know, business, uh, the economy, right. Has a number of challenges headwinds facing it today. Um, would you mind kind of elaborating, since we have you here in, in this space, uh, elaborating on how you see the business climate today in, in the auto world, uh, major risks to the business, how you're managing those risks? I think uh, the auto business right now is in, in a very peculiar place, which is which it's never seen before. There was some issues around the 2008 again, for financial crisis where auto prices, where car prices dropped and you know, there was all kinds of PNL implications for the big auto lenders. As you know, top the sort of big bailout of the of the Detroit manufacturers. All of that happened during the during the financial crisis. This is nowhere near that. But what we are seeing is this sort of structural uh, issue around new cars, new cars just not being manufactured at a fast enough rate uh, to meet demand, and therefore prices being bid higher and higher. Uh, we also are seeing uh, a kind of weird dynamic develop between manufacturers and dealers, where manufacturers are beginning to see shorter inventory periods as probably being a good thing for the industry. So the industry typically ran around 100 days of inventory, which is about three months of supply, and they were okay with that. Uh, that number has dropped dramatically. Right? The data that I last looked at, there are right now 900,000 used cars, uh, new cars and dealer lots. And last, last year, this time, it was 1.8 million. So you know, it's like a significant shrinkage in new car supply. Uh, coming out of you know the chip shortage, but so at the same time, what's happened is that uh, the used car demand has gone up and used car prices have been bid up. So how many of you today are able to get much more, or at least as much for the vehicle that you've used for two or three years as you paid for it? Um, and that is again something that the used car market has never seen. So on the on on balance, if you look at the United States, seventeen odd million new cars are sold every year, about forty million used cars. Uh, the overall supply of vehicles has not, the overall demand for vehicles has not increased dramatically. So between used and new, it's about the same. But there's the shift now of more of fewer new cars being sold and more used cars being sold. Um, and since used cars are not regulated by MSRP which is the manufacturer's suggested retail price, uh, you, see, you see all kinds of inflation happening on the used car side. Uh, for a finance company like ours, it, it has the, the implication is that our recovery rates on, uh, are significantly higher because you're able to get much more for the value of the vehicle that you repossess. But at the same time, it's going to lead, led to another sort of knock-on side effect, which is customers are less likely to go to Lincoln because of the value of the vehicle that they have it's depreciating at a much slower rate than it was earlier. So, you know, in the, the old sort of proverb that they throw the keys on the table and walk away from the car, that doesn't apply anymore because your loan is very, very, very rapidly, much more rapidly going below the equity of the value of the vehicle. So there's less incentive for you to default 
so we've seen that. So delinquencies are deflated, losses, frequency is deflated, severity is deflated. Uh, and I guess we're all sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop, which is how is this all going to end? I'm increasingly, as we get more data on, on this, uh, I, I don't believe that it'll be a cliff correction. I think it'll be a gradual sort of soft landing and a normalization of prices. It might even extend into the next couple of years. So it could go all the way up to 2024. Um, but the incredible part of this cliff, since you're, you know, you're, you're, you're an astute observer of the market, is that the United States, through its social experiment of the stimulus package, has actually proved that by virtue of being the reserve currency of the world, we can actually print money, put it in people's pockets, and engineer a soft landing. Uh, you know, and even the recession that they're talking about, it could be a managed recession. You could have an, you know, a sort of deliberate steer down into a higher unemployment rate and eventually the Fed builds up enough dry powder through its interest rate policy to be able to then, you know, release into the market. The, the, uh, my last question before we kind of go over here to, to some of the questions that are coming in, I'd, I'd like to kind of stay with this theme because clearly understanding, you know, or trying to understand where things are heading from a, an economic, geopolitical, post-pandemic, type of uh, scenario, right? How do you and your organization vet out what we just talked about? The potential trajectory of, of interest rates, which certainly affect your market, inflation, policy response. I mean, who in the organization is doing that for you uh, or is involved with that? How do you come to sort of some collective mindset on uh, vetting those things out, as I said earlier? So I have the good fortune of having some very smart people in my organization. I have an extraordinarily skillful CFO who does a lot of the thinking in, uh, on this. We're also very exposed to the public markets on securitizations. We have the largest issuer of subprime ABS in the, in, in the US. So we get the, we sort of see the bleeding edge of the market, you know, when the two-year swap goes up and the interest rates go up, we immediately see the effect on our, uh, on our uh, funding. So, uh, but we are also fortunate because we have access to uh, our retail bank in Boston. We have access to their balance sheet. So we, we are a full spectrum lender across uh, you know, the entire gamut of credit scores. So I think um, between my CFO and my CRO, uh, we have this sort of very fine tuned sense of where we think uh, things are gonna end, but we only think sort of in the short term. For us, it's sort of this year and at most next year. And we will be able to give you a pretty well-informed opinion of where, how we think things are going to end up. For us, it's a question of funding costs. How is that going to reflect in the interest rate that's charged to the customer? And how are you going to keep the balance between charging too, too much and too little? Because the auto market, as you know, is a bid-out market where you, every deal is bid out to multiple lenders and you, 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 know, you get anti-selected very quickly if you're not priced and deal structures don't work. At that, so you have to stay competitive, but you're also at some point the air gets thinner when the cost of funds go up and your competitors don't necessarily price to the market that you're pricing to. So it's a very, very fine, you know, fine dance of sort of managing credit quality and keeping your head above water as far as spreads are concerned. Fascinating. Well, that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna swing over here and I'm I'm looking at the clock and I'm looking at the questions and I'm gonna at least try to get this one in here. This is an interesting one. It says, hi, Mahesh, how do you see CROs championing digital initiatives like payments or smart contracts, especially if they are passionate about some of these things? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, that's the zeitgeist of the moment, right? I mean, if you're not in digital, you're not, you don't exist. Uh, and particularly in the auto business, I think the pandemic turned everything around. The dealers have started investing in digital platforms. I think uh, if you're one of those guys who's afraid of talking technology, I think you better st start studying up because I think very quickly that's, that's going to become almost, it, it's almost become a survival necessity. Companies have to invest in technology. I've been extraordinarily fort fortunate. I work for a very forward thinking uh, chairman of the group who Anna Botines, uh, uh, you know, she's never said no to a single technology idea uh, and, and really, really wants to ahead, invest ahead of the market and be ahead of, innovation and stuff like that. So for those of you who are probably reading the news, we, 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 we've done some, some tremendous partnerships of late, uh, you know, with fintechs, et cetera. So I think the, ro this, the role of the CRO and the role of the risk organization is particularly important because they, again, are the people who will tell, they inform the business whether something 
whether we're going down the right path or not. The three years that I spent at Visa sort of exposed me to that. There was one really interesting story at the time that I was CRO at Visa. Apple Pay was being created, right? And we sort of came up with this idea that there was going to be provisioning of a credit card inside an iPhone. And the card number was going to be tokenized because somebody walking past a phone with a, with a, with, with a device could actually skim the card information. So it was a tokenized card number. It was provisioned on the iPhone. Uh, I, Apple, of course, wouldn't show us their device. They brought it in a black box with a bunch of USB ports and we were able to sort of test it and all of that. Uh, it went through, you know, the, the new product approval process and all of that. Everything worked out. And then uh, one of the Canadian banks, somebody was able to hack it and basically figure it out and figure out uh, a way to replay a transaction, basically interrupt a transaction from the time that the phone signaled it to the point of sale terminal, pick it up, and rerun the transaction and get a get an approval. Who could have thought of that? I mean, I took I took a beating from the CEO at the time about not having thought of this in this sort of situation. And it then struck me that I couldn't look around the room and say say what I just said, which is you know this is almost impossible for me to a war game. But this is exactly where the risk organization, a really good risk manager, would have been extraordinarily effective. Is study up, understand, talk to people in the industry, figure out what's going on, and then come and tell us what, you know, what the issues are. The connectivity here with the industry, particularly nowadays, is extremely important. Fascinating story there, absolutely. Well, Mahesh, I'm, I think we're, we're just about out of time on this session, and uh, wow, the time flew. Uh, I, I certainly learned a lot, as always, when, when we get together, so thank you so much on behalf of Smith and on behalf of all our attendees today, uh, I sure do appreciate the uh, learning from you every time we get together. So thanks again, and, and thank you everyone that attended, and we'll see you here down the road, not too distant future. Thank you all. Thank you, Cliff. Thanks, Rob. And thanks, Nima. Thanks, thank you Mahesh. Thanks, Cliff. Take, Take care. care.